This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of illegal drugs, violence, or criminal activity in any way. You've heard about the El Chapos and the El Mayos and the Sinaloa cartel and the extreme violence that exists today between competing drug cartels in Mexico. But it hasn't always been that way. In fact, in the beginning, one man, with a little help from his friends, was able to bring together most of the competing drug factions to form one super cartel, who then combined efforts with the Colombian cartels to form a conglomerate that dominated the drug trafficking in North America in the 80s. So what happened? How did they learn the trade? what caused their demise, and just who was Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching A Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the man who is generally considered the father of drug trafficking in Mexico and who, for a time, was able to bring together all the competing drug factions. Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, who is known by his aliases, El Jefe de Jefe, or the Boss of Bosses, and El Padrino, the Godfather, is one of the founders of the Guadalajara Cartel, who in the 70s and the 80s controlled most of the drug trafficking in Mexico along the United States corridor. We're going to talk about his life. We're going to talk about how he got into law enforcement, which led him to being the head of security of the mayor of Sinaloa. That relationship gave him the political contacts he would use to shield his future illegal drug operations. We're going to talk about the members and the associates of the Guadalajara cartel. And it reads like a who's who of drug cartel history, with no less than 10 future cartel leaders. We're going to look at the rise, and then we're going to look at the fall of the Guadalajara cartel following its involvement in the death of U.S. DEA agent Kiki Camarena. Finally, we're going to talk about Gallardo's arrest and where he is today. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, you got a question, you got a comment, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, do so now and hit that notification bell so you're notified every time we upload. And you guys know it, I love it when you share me on social media. Recall that all of the episodes are available in podcast format, and we got merch. If you want to pick up some Lawyer Up swag, the link to order is in the description below. And finally, we are introducing a new members-only content section. You can get early access to videos before they are approved for mass distribution on YouTube. So if you're interested in early content, you can sign up below. Miguel and Angel Felix Gallardo was born on January 8th of 1946, and he grew up on a ranch in Bella Vista in the outskirts of Culiacan, Sinaloa. Felix Gallardo graduated from high school and then studied business in college before taking a job as a Mexican federal judicial police agent. The federal judicial police were akin to the FBI or the DEA in the United States. Their stated purpose was to enforce federal law and to combat the narcotics trade, except that it was full of corruption. So once thoroughly embedded, Gallardo actually used the agency to shield and protect the drug trade. This agency was so corrupt that it was completely disbanded in 2002. Today, a totally separate investigative agency serves as its federal law enforcement organization. But let's get back to Gallardo. While working as a federal police agent in the mid to late 60s, he was assigned to be the family bodyguard of the governor of Sinaloa, Leopoldo Sanchez Celis. The governor took an instant liking to Gallardo in a relationship that would ultimately involve into Gallardo being named the godfather of Celis's son. And it was this relationship that allowed Gallardo to develop the political connections that would serve to protect and build his drug trafficking organization. 
Felix Gallardo would get his introduction to the drug trafficking trade through his connections with Pedro Aviles Perez, a.k.a. Don Pedro. And if you know anything about the history of Mexican drug cartels, it all starts with Don Pedro. He was also known as El Leon de la Sierra, or the Lion of the Sierras, referring to the Sierra Madre mountain range in Mexico, wherein he lived and worked. Now, Don Pedro became the first major Mexican drug lord beginning in the late 60s and is considered to be the first generation of major Mexican drug smugglers. They moved mostly marijuana and heroin, and he was the first drug lord to use an aircraft to smuggle drugs into the United States. Now, second generation traffickers such as Felix Gallardo, Rafael Caro Cantero, known as Rafa, and Ernesto Fonseco Carrillo, known as Don Neto, would all go on to say that they learned the trade from Don Pedro. Now, drug trafficking has drastically changed over the past 60 years. In the beginning, violence was unnecessary and formal organizations were scarce. In fact, if you go back to when Gallardo was just getting his start, only two major drug trafficking organizations even existed in Mexico. Now compare that to today where law enforcement identifies the existence of nine separate drug cartels and 36 additional cell groups or gangs that are all involved in some way in the Mexican drug trade. But in the early 70s, there were only two organizations called Clicas or Clicks that were involved in the drug trade. They were the Gulf and the Aviles organization. Now the Gulf cartel, as it is now called, was led by Juan Nepomuceno Guerrero, and it had been around a lot longer getting started in the 1930s, smuggling alcohol into the U.S. during Prohibition. They operated out of Matamoros, Tamaulipas, which is right across the border from Brownsville, Texas. And they were involved in a lot of different types of organized crime, gambling, prostitution, car theft, and they peddled a little heroin. But in the 70s, moving drugs wasn't the number one area for them. Now, juxtaposed was the Aviles organization with its center of operations among the Sierra Madre mountain range within the Triangulo Dorado or the Golden Triangle region of Chihuahua, Sinaloa, and Durango. It was from this remote location that he was able to establish a drug trafficking organization that sowed, cultivated, and distributed mass amounts of contraband. The group primarily trafficked marijuana and heroin, but also was one of the first to start trafficking cocaine into the United States from South America. And this was before Pablo Escobar emerged onto the scene. And the name of the game was to get the drugs into the United States. As the organization grew, Don Pedro acquired several men under his command, and it is a veritable who's who of drug lords. So here we go. In Pedro Aviles Perez's inner circle was Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, who would later be the leader of the Guadalajara cartel. Ernesto Fonseco Carrillo Don Neto would be the right-hand man of Felix Gallardo and a future Guadalajara cartel founder. He and Gallardo would later be among the first to start working with Pablo Escobar in Colombia. And Rafael Caro Quintero Rafa would be the third founder of the Guadalajara cartel. Now down a rung was Juan Jose Espargoza Moreno, El Azul or Blue, because of his skin and its dark, dark color. He would later be involved in the Guadalajara cartel, the Juarez cartel, and eventually work with El Chapo in the Sinaloa cartel. Then there was Amado Carrillo Fuentes, the Lord of the Skies, who would revolutionize smuggling cocaine through the air with his fleet of airplanes, and who would later seize control of the Juarez cartel for himself. Ismael El Mayo Zambala would become one of the founders of the Juarez and Sinaloa cartels, after the Guadalajara cartel broke up, and Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo, of later Sinaloa cartel fame. Finally, the Ariano Felix brothers and the Beltran Leva brothers were all getting their start at this time with the Aviles organization. So if you ever wondered where all of this drug cartel mess started, it was with Don Pedro. And as I mentioned, back then, at least in the beginning, there really was no violence. And I know this is hard to believe with this bunch, but Don Pedro prohibited it. He saw violence as unnecessarily drawing attention to the group and a threat to the business. 
So how can you be involved in the drug trade without the use of violence? I mean, if you don't protect it, somebody else is going to take it, right? But it wasn't always that way. Aviles was able to protect his empire with dollars rather than bullets. And here's how. Through his connections, including Felix Gallardo, he was able to broker a deal with law enforcement for the group. The deal had two rules. Don Pedro would be given specific zones of operation where he would be allowed to traffic drugs as long as, number one, he kept the peace in those zones of operation, and number two, he was willing to circulate some of the drug money for the benefit of the local economy. And things went well during the early and mid-70s. As the group's success grew, several other traffickers or drug plazas began to spring up throughout Mexico. And then things really started going sideways in 1978. Now, information from the United States and Mexican authorities would later reveal that a power struggle had emerged between Don Pedro and Felix Gallardo that would ultimately lead to each man plotting a way to seize control of the cartel for himself. Now, we know that just prior to Don Pedro's death, there was a meeting of the leaders of the various plazas that had sprung up in Mexico. Gallardo wanted to establish one large group of all the major drug traffickers. Aviles didn't really see the need and took particular offense when one of his plaza rivals credited Gallardo for bringing all the parties together. Regardless, we know that shortly after this meeting, Don Pedro is killed. And to this day, much mystery surrounds how his death went down. Now, the official version is that he was killed in a shootout with law enforcement on September 15th of 1978, about six miles outside of Culiacan at a police checkpoint near a junction in the highway known as the Y. But there are at least four different versions of what actually went down. Now, the most interesting version is the Narcos Mexico Netflix version. In the Narcos version, Don Pedro is gunned down by the police and then Gallardo is handled a pistol to fire the final shot into his skull. In the TV version, the whole scenario had been set up after a plot by Aviles to kill Gallardo that was discovered by Don Neto, who then flipped the script, enabling Gallardo to kill him first. Now, it should be noted that the producers of Narcos have said all along that about half of what you see is based upon fact, and about half of it is totally made up. So, what really happened? Well, who knows? But if you are interested in examining all of the different versions of how he was killed, check out my full-length video on Pedro Aviles Perez. So, with the death of Don Pedro, Miguel Angel, Felix Gallardo, Ernesto Fonseco Carrillo, Don Neto, and Rafael Caro Quintero Rafa would then take over the organization's leadership. And pursuant to the earlier meeting, they coordinated the various plazas, their production and operations, and formed the core of what came to be known as the Guadalajara Cartel. And these guys took Sling and Dope to the next level. With his time in the Mexican Federal Judicial Police and his affiliation with the governor of Sinaloa, Gallardo was able to call upon his numerous political relationships to protect this new organization. Then they upped the drug game significantly. First, they started producing high-quality seedless marijuana called Sensamilla in mass quantities in large multi-acre fields. And really, nobody in history had produced marijuana on this scale before. And it was about this time in the early 80s that Colombian drug cartels were shoveling massive amounts of cocaine into the United States. And DEA efforts were focused primarily on Florida, which was the major shipping destination for Colombian cartels who were importing tons and tons of coke by way of the Bahamas and then up to Florida through Miami. So to avoid this law enforcement scrutiny in Florida, the Colombian cartels begin to utilize Mexico as their primary transshipment point. This was facilitated through Honduran smuggler Juan Ramon Mara Ballesteros, who was the Guadalajara cartel's primary connection to the Colombian cartels and who had originally introduced Aviles to Santiago Ocampo of the Cali cartel, one of Colombia's largest. But this time, instead of taking cash payments for their services like Don Pedro did, 
The Guadalajara cartel would take a cut of the cocaine they were transporting it and they would sell it for themselves. This turned out to be very profitable for them. Estimates put the increased profits of the Guadalajara cartel by doing business this way at approximately $5 billion annually. And by the mid 80s, they were also working with Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel in assisting with trafficking boatloads of cocaine across the United States border. Again, this was facilitated through Mata Ballesteros. So drug trafficking in North America in the 80s was dominated by the Guadalajara cartel, who saw legendary traffickers like El Chapo and El Mayo moving up in the organization both of whom have history of videos on my channel if you are interested. It was also during this time period that a third major cartel emerged, the Juarez cartel in Chihuahua right across the border from El Paso, and they were basically doing the same thing. So it's the mid 80s and life was good with the Guadalajara cartel, really good. Gallardo was king, and by now he had acquired over 50 houses, 200 ranches, and was estimated to be worth $500 million. And for the most part, they followed Don Pedro's example of protecting their trade primarily with money and bribes rather than bullets, as much of what they were doing was being protected by local law enforcement, politicians, the Mexican DFS, which was their equivalent of the CIA back then, and also the United States CIA, who was using the Mexican drug trade to secretly fund Ronald Reagan's war against communism in Nicaragua, which was a big deal because after the Iran-Contra scandal blew up, it became the only way the Contras were receiving financial support. However, not everybody in law enforcement was on board. The United States DEA and the Mexican military were still seeking to bust drug traffickers. So in 1984, acting on information from US DEA agent Kiki Camarena, 450 Mexican soldiers backed by helicopters conducted Operation Godfather and destroyed a 2,500 acre marijuana plantation known as Rancho Buffalo in Chihuahua that had an estimated annual production of billions of dollars. This was an unbelievable blow to the Guadalajara cartel and to the United States ability through the CIA to fund ongoing operations of the Contras in Nicaragua. And this was the second field that had been busted by Kiki. So he had become quite the problem. The DEA says that by January of 1985, Kiki was extremely close to unlocking a multi-billion dollar drug pipeline involving the CIA, Mexican government officials, politicians, local police, and the Guadalajara cartel. And it was because he was about to expose the entire operation that he was abducted in broad daylight on February 7th of 1985. Kiki was surrounded by five men, Jalisco police officers on the cartel's payroll, who threw him into a car. Camarena was then taken to a cartel mansion at 881 Lopa de Vega Drive in western Guadalajara. There Kiki was beaten, tortured, and interrogated over a 30-hour period. Ultimately, Camarena's body was found almost a month later, wrapped in plastic and ditched next to a ranch in Michoacan. It is a fascinating story with complicity of the United States CIA, but the specifics are beyond the scope of this video. So if you are interested, check out the entire story of Kiki Camarena, also available on this channel. So Camarena's torture and murder prompted a swift reaction from the United States DEA, which launched Operation Leyenda, or Legend, the largest DEA homicide investigation ever undertaken. And under pressure from the United States government, Mexican officials quickly apprehended Don Neto and Rafa. But Felix Gallardo, with his connections, kept a low profile and was protected and even hidden by politicians in Sinaloa and then later in Guadalajara, where he was able to evade arrest until April 8th of 1989. He was 43 when he was arrested. Gallardo was charged in both Mexico and the United States with the kidnapping and murder of Kiki Camarena, as well as racketeering, drug smuggling, and several other crimes. 
And the hunt for and the arrest of Gallardo was really the catalyst for exposing the widespread corruption within the political and law enforcement realms in Mexico. Within days of Gallardo's arrest, several police commanders were also arrested, with as many as 90 other officers defecting and just disappearing. But, hey, the show must go on. And even though he was in custody, Gallardo was still in charge. However, with the big three behind bars, Gallardo contemplated that it would be more efficient and less likely to be disrupted by law enforcement if they diversified. So in a meeting set up by his lawyer, several of the top narcos in Mexico met in 1989 at a house in Acapulco where they divided up the Guadalajara cartel's plazas or territories. The Tijuana route would go to Gallardo's nephews, the Ariano Felix brothers. The Juarez route would stay with the Carrillo Fuentes family, that's Don Neto's bunch, and Miguel Caro Quintero would run the Sonora Corridor, and that was Rafa's group. Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo, and Hector Luis Palma were left with the Pacific Coast operations with Ismael Zambala Garcia, El Mayo, ultimately joining them. As for Felix Gallardo, he would be sentenced to 40 years in prison. And after serving 28 of those years in 2017, he was retried and sentenced to an additional 37 years for the death of Kiki Camarena. Interestingly, then and now, Gallardo has always insisted that he had nothing to do with Kiki's murder. And in fact, he had warned Rafa that killing a U.S. DEA agent would unnecessarily draw the wrath of the United States government onto the Guadalajara cartel. And of course, he was right. But back in 1989, we have a whole new way of doing business in narco world with the subdivision of the Guadalajara cartel. Now we have four major players in the game. You have the Tijuana cartel, the Juarez cartel, what would become known as the Sinaloa cartel, and don't forget that the Gulf cartel was still in existence. But the first three were all comprised of leaders who were originally with the Guadalajara cartel. And these three new cartels played nice for about 30 minutes. The Tijuana cartel would get the violence ball a rolling by executing Armando Lopez, who was one of El Chapo's right-hand men. And while El Chapo didn't respond immediately, within a couple of years, each of the three new cartels were actively trying to execute the leaders of the rival group. And all the while, Gallardo was still attempting to coordinate these fractured cartels from his cell phone from prison. That was until he was transferred in 1993 to a maximum security prison. No phone. And that was the end of any hopes for him to continue to oversee the groups. And he knew it. The guard who transported Gallardo would later state that he cried the whole way, lamenting it was the end for him. Gallardo was taken to the Federal Social Readaptation Center No. 1, Altiplano, in Juarez, which opened in 1991 and was billed as Mexico's Alcatraz or Supermax prison. It has and currently holds dozens of drug cartel leaders, and it was touted as impenetrable and inescapable. That was until June 11th of 2015 when El Chapo escaped out through an almost mile long tunnel that was dug under the prison and then up 33 feet tapping in through the floor of the shower in El Chapo's cell. That event is also beyond the scope of this video, but it's one of my favorite all time narco stories. And I tell you all about it in my video on El Chapo. So check that out if you are interested. Gallardo, he was not so lucky. His transfer to that maximum security facility really dashed any hope that he had of rekindling unity amongst the competing cartels. And in the 30 years that followed the collapse of the Guadalajara cartel, the four cartels that existed would fight and fracture into nine cartels that currently dominate the Mexican drug trade. And today, the groups have chosen to rely on violence to claim various territories and trafficking routes instead of the bribery that had marked their predecessors. It is these continuing disputes and escalating conflicts that has created the political, social, and military chaos that we now know as the Mexican drug war. As for Gallardo, he has sat in prison continually since 1989. 
As he aged, Felix Gallardo had experienced several medical conditions, including deafness, loss of an eye, and circulation problems. For a spell, he was confined to a 14 by 8 cell and was not allowed to leave or even use the recreational areas. In March of 2013, Gallardo launched a legal battle requesting to serve out his prison sentence at home once he reached the age of 70. However, a Mexican federal court would deny his petition, although in 2014, it would approve his request to transfer him to a medium security prison in Guadalajara due to his declining health. And that is where he sits today. In 2008, journalist Diego Enrique Osorno was able to contact Felix Gallardo through his son and collect some handwritten memoirs and narratives about his arrest and legal proceedings. It provided some insight into his family tree, but little else. They were kind of scattered, random thoughts that evidenced a declining mental state. If you are interested in the selection of the 35 handwritten pages, they were published in the Mexican magazine Gato Pardo. Regardless, Gallardo's influence lives on today with no less than nine family members who went on to serve as members of the Tijuana and the Sinaloa cartel. So that is the episode. I hope that you enjoyed going way back into drug cartel history to see where it all started in Mexico. If you are interested in more information about Felix Gallardo, he is featured in seasons one, two, and three of the Netflix series, Narcos Mexico. Thanks for watching and remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share. That's all for today. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money.